Hello and welcome to ET Auto Startup Pad. I hope you all are keeping well and safe. This is a show that provides a platform for all the investors, industry experts, and also the startup founders to understand what are the opportunity that is emerging in the transformed and new mobility space. Today, our participant startup is Exponent Energy which is a technology provider in charging and battery space. They are basically trying to address both end of the energy need that is going to be in the mobility space. I'm joined by the co-founder of Sponent Energy, Mr. Arun Vinayak, uh, who is the chief executive officer and also the co-founder of the company, Arun is a long time in the startup space. He was one of the co-founders, or you can say founding partner at Ata Energy, which is another electric scooter manufacturing company. We all know about that. Uh, the other co-founder, Sanjay Balyal, he could not join today because he's not well. He's probably down with fever and cold, so he could not take off uh, today's show. But thank you so much, Arun, for joining ET Auto. Before we start, let me introduce today's expert that we have. We have with us Vinay Piparsania. He is the Chief Executive Officer at IIT Delhi Endowment Management Foundation. Vinay has been helping startups, incubating the startup founders at IIT Delhi, and there are lot, many centers of excellence in across the IITs where Vinay is trying to help these young and bright minds to be job creator rather than uh, a job seeker from the IIT, IITs across India. Thank you so much, Vinay, for joining in today. But before we take the uh, conversation forward, I would invite Varun, uh, sorry, I would like to invite Arun to present his views and his thoughts and pitch. How does he look at exponent energy? I heard that you have already raised about 6 million units I would also like to know why did you split from Ether Energy to start uh, this business? Over to you, Arun. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ravi, for having me. Wonderful to be here. Uh, uh, it's an honor. Uh, and uh, I've, I've got a deck, so you know, if that, that can be shared, uh, I'd love to uh, sort of take everyone through that. Right? Uh, and, and then uh, maybe let's talk about what we're doing in Exponent. Uh, well, maybe I'll answer the other question first, which is why why, why leave Aether and do this? I think uh, fundamentally, I, I, I we started Aether in 2013, back when uh, building EVs uh, wasn't very popular. Very few people in the world even believed EVs can be better. I think we, we truly it's believed in it. It started off as a geek project. We were just, you know, sort of screwing around with batteries and we realized, hey, listen, if you design and build EVs, they can actually be better than petrol vehicles. They can be faster, they're sexier, they're better performance, better stability. Uh, and well, a lot, a lot of people believe that. So it took us a uh, few years, but we had to figure out how to completely rethink product design around uh, this new piece of technology. How do you rethink automotive design altogether? And EVs change the rules. EVs fundamentally change the rules. They also give you a whole bunch of new ways to redesign and rethink automotive ecosystems, right? And uh, I think, I think that was fun. Uh, did that from 2013, put together a large team, led the product development. And I think by 2018, 2019, we had established ourselves as one of the best products, not just the best EV products, but one of the best scooters you can buy. Um, and uh, we also, along the way, set up a large team that can now consistently churn out good quality products. And I think as a founder uh, or a partner, I think your job is to make yourself obsolete. And I think I did a good job of, of of getting myself, getting myself to a place where you know the whole team was doing a great job. Around the same time, around 2018, 2019, India decided to go electric, right? Uh, the government is big on it, so many OEMs. Uh, and a lot of these OEMs also started reaching out to Aether to say, hey, listen, can we use Aether's batteries, technology, motor, software, etc., to build products on top of? And we genuinely tried it, right? I personally led the platform play to see, can we create a horizontal within Aether? Uh, but, you know, we... It is such a vertically integrated product strategy, right? We build our own batteries, our own frames, our own vehicles, our own charging network, our own distribution that we make a lot of crazy decisions at Aether that only makes sense for our product. So it didn't make sense to create a horizontal. But I think that that process got me excited about 
creating an horizontal okay? and i realized okay building products for the top 10 person is cool and i think that's where the early adopter market starts and i think the zero to one shift is done and so i think in some sense the next problem is how do you take get all of india to go electric right uh, and i think uh, to do that we need many technology enablers across uh, across the spectrum uh, so that oems can quickly leverage technology we can have rapid product development across multiple segments and we can get all of it electric in the next few years and uh, i would have a day i would like to see that what's your future plan how do you want to do this and what is your usp because there are several companies startups working in the same space just want to understand what kind of potential exponent energy brings to the table and why should somebody put their bet as an investor or the industry stakeholders at exponent energy got it uh, is uh, is my deck visible i'm not sure uh, mm, yes it is it is Uh, you have ten right. minutes to conclude this, yeah. Right. So fundamentally, rapid charging by itself is not uh, is not new, right? Uh, rapid charging has been around for for many years now, right? Uh, almost thirteen uh, uh, years, right? But but fundamentally, it's always been done by using uh, either you fancy cell technology, maybe LTOs or super capacitors, or it's been done by upsizing chargers by trying to force fit force feed batteries more energy than they can handle. it's never there's there's not been much nuance to it right? the problem with using things like ltos and super capacitors is that they're very expensive they're also very heavy they're three to four times more expensive three to four times heavier than regular cells right um, which has always limited these use cases to pilots uh, but it's never been affordable or scalable that's what we change at exponent we are able to rapid charge regular cells you know these are your regular lfp and nmc cells we are able to slap on our technology on top of it which is fundamentally our bms Our algorithms, our thermal management systems, and we're able to fundamentally be much smarter about how we charge cells, right? Uh, and that changes the game respect to how fast you can charge these regular cells, how long you can keep them lasting, all without taking a cost or weight hit, right? And uh, that makes rapid charging for the first time affordable and scalable, and that's what differentiates us from any other anyone else working on rapid charging. And and we don't see ourselves as competition. There are different types of approaches to rapid charging. There are there is working on the cell level itself uh, but then what we focus on exponent is everything but the cell right uh, i mean even if you make the cell charge in 5 to 15 minutes in a in the lab you will not actually get 15 minute charging out there in the field right so you actually need the rest of the systems around it right uh, which is the the uh, i don't think animation is playing but uh, rest of the systems around it, maybe the thermal management systems the battery management systems uh, the software the connectors all together all of that right and on the other end you can't just set up a large charger and say hey this is the world's fastest charger is going to charge vehicles in 15 minutes There's a lot of pr pieces that go around that that's not true right uh, even if you set up a really large charger it will only charge up as quickly as what the battery allows right so fundamentally if you look at it there's a cell on one end there's a there's a there's a grid on the other side how do i take energy from the grid and dump it into the cell right that's fundamentally the hard bit and if you want to do this in 4 to 8 hours it's pretty easy but if you want to do this in 15 minutes you need to handle a lot of energy and sort of very accurately dump it into hundreds of cells into in a battery on the vehicle side right and it's uh, it it requires a lot of software it requires a lot of electronics and that's fundamentally the full stack that we've innovated on at exponent right right from the of course there's the battery there's the charging stations but apart from that there's the bms that sort of is the brain the connectors the intelligence that all of this put together achieve uh, this rapid charging on regular cells right and uh, what what's unique about us is we are cell agnostic we're able to do this on any cell so you have eight different cells that we already have in our portfolio and we do this on regular lfp cells so which i've said that that that's critical to making this affordable and scalable uh, we are able to go anywhere between 40 to 800 volts so people so oems can build any battery uh, using any cell any voltage any number of wheels we charge all of them in 15 minutes right and uh, i think that's the sort of flexibility that's needed to really unlock all vehicles and all OEMs to build whatever they want right and uh, and um, so that, that that's 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 what we do how do we do it we i think the animation is in place so i'll sort of skip that but what we are able to do is we really able to get deeper into what's happening inside uh, the cell right so when you rapid when you when you charge a cell uh, you have something called a cathode or the anode right uh, 
right? And uh, you have uh, elect- lithium ion to jump from the cathode and swim across the anode. Yeah, so then, uh, yeah. So uh, the faster you charge, is generally more lithium ions that leads to a whole bunch of crowding. And you can say don't fast charge because that leads to lithium plating, right? And that's true. If you generally don't understand what's happening inside a cell and you blindly rapid charge it, you will end up with damaging cells. But what we are able to do is we are able to understand what's happening inside a cell. We're able to rapid charge it, but we also know when something stressful is happening inside a cell. And we're able to course correct accordingly and do the right sort of charge profile. So most chargers today do something called CCC, which is constant current, constant voltage. Right? That's charger, that's battery saying, hey, ba- charger, start charging, stop charging. And chargers just blindly dump energy on batteries for 90 minutes, right? Without really caring about battery health. Uh, we've sort of rewritten the rules on a whole bunch of these things. And uh, that's what allows us to rapid charge regular cells. Uh, Arun, I'll just go to the few fundamental question. As you also mentioned that uh, rapid charging or fast charging, uh, because of the nature of like, current it uses, you know, it directly uh, impacts the life cycle of the battery. Can you please give me a sense? How are you protecting and what is the general, uh, if you look at the life cycle of a battery, how much impact is it on that compared to the slow charging, uh, you know, or the fast charging that is seen? Can you give us some data on that? Got it. So charging a cell is pretty stressful for the cell, right? Uh, when you're charging a cell, you're increasing the potential energy of the cell, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, which fundamentally is like rolling the stone up the hill, right? Uh, it's very stressful for the cell. Right, uh, discharging is you're relaxing the cell and pretty easy to get away with. Right, uh, you can really it's really hard to damage a cell by. Can you tell me the life cycle? Suppose in a slow charging, if the life cycle of the battery is X, then what happens in case of using your fast charging? Because generally, it really brings down the uh, life cycle of the battery substantially if you use rapid charging. Right. Obviously, of the, the current that way you use AC or DC. That's impact. Yes. So, so, so as I was explaining, charging is a stressful process, right? And uh, what creates a stress is that whole process we talked about, which is how lithium ions are going from the cathode to the anode, right? And uh, what generally causes damage while charging is a thing called impedance, which gets built up, and then this this phenomenon called lithium plating, right? Now, the faster you charge, the probability of lithium plating goes up, right? So if you do this blindly, you definitely will lead to faster degradation, right? With faster charging. Uh, but what we're able to do is not really, is to prevent lithium plating altogether while we're fast charging. And that comes from understanding what's happening inside the cell, but completely rethinking how smart our algorithms are and charges and batteries are constantly in sync, understanding each other, the charge is always trying different profiles to. No, I just them. want to know the end result, Arun. What's the end result? How are so how much is the warranty? Yeah. What is right. your business model? How are you trying to get the revenue? What is your core business model? Because in charging, I heard one of the charging provider once says that uh, it's a social work rather than working in the ch- uh, charging space. How do you see this? How do you make this a business? Sense. No, so, so one of the biggest problems today with charging is one of the founders said that it's providing charging infrastructure is kind of social work. It's not a profitable business. But is that your thought too? No, that that that's true today with slow charging, right? So if I charge, if I take three to four hours to charge, then I can only sell so much energy on a piece of land. So you know, today charging stations don't make money, and you're right. Most charging stations are set up by marketing. It's, it's either a marketing stand or a social cost, or you know, it's some government subsidy that's sort of pushing it. But that's what rapid charging changes. Now, on the same piece of land, you can now sell energy to 40, 50, 60, 100 vehicles. Right? That completely changes the unit economics of setting up a charging station. And that's one of the key unlocks that we are focusing on. How can you make a charging station a really profitable business? In fact, more than a petrol station. So you can get multiple business owners to invest and the network grows more organically. And I think that's the way to set up a sustainable network and not, you know, focus on marketing stunts or or, 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 or government. At this point, I think Vinay would be the right person to further go ahead with the conversation because he understands much better than I do. <laughs> he studies every day uh, this uh, nitty-gritty of the charging infrastructure, the EV 
uh, setup that is being built around new mobility. So, Vinay, you can shoot your questions. And yeah. Give your no, and, you know, uh, Naveel, you brought up a, a good point. One is the academic and the study part of it, right? It's the, and the real thing is, how do you make it customer friendly? If you think about it, and Arun, this is the real, I think, uh, model I'd like to understand as your startup. Okay, you're addressing a problem which is fast charging, and you're trying to get closer to consumers who today are moving away from their patrol vehicles, right? We're used to going up to a gas station. It doesn't matter which gas station. We don't even need to know the brand of the gas station. We just go in, we say, you know, give me uh, patrol or give me diesel. I mean, that's about all we want to say. And within four or five minutes, we're done and we're out. And the pricing and everything is predictable. I know how many liters I got, how many units. It's transparent in that aspect. It's metric. It's everything. Electricity is a tough one right? As a consumer, I don't even know what's happening. And I don't want to know what's happening, to be quite yeah. honest. But I want yeah. my experience to be the same that I'm used to. I go in, five minutes, I'm out. So, and, and, I, and we understand that that'll be, that's why swapping is a better idea because of this and that. So there are many things that are happening. There's no standardization. Can I be assured that I'm going to get a quality charge? It's the same charge which I require. You know, cars today have no standards. You can have a 24 volt system, a 72 volt system. They're in number of combinations. How are you dealing with that? How are you making something, rationalizing and making it a model that can be one scale, but more importantly, standardized so that you have something that you can predictably produce? That's a challenge. How did you manage that? Vinay, you're absolutely bang on, right? Like, uh, and I think you've uncovered two aspects to this, to, to the problem. One is on the industry side and the other is the consumer side, right? And uh, Maybe I'd like to spend a minute on energy itself, right? Uh, energy itself is changing, right? Uh, there's a new paradigm. In, as you said, in the diesel world, uh, you bought a vehicle and you don't care where you refuel, right? You can go anywhere and you can refuel. And the, where you refuel doesn't impact the life and performance of your vehicle, right? The automotive industry and the energy industry have fundamentally worked in isolation, right? Uh, and energy in the diesel world is all about upstream. A guy who dis discovered, extracted, and refined. And the transaction is pretty easy. Anyone can do the transaction. It's a straight opposite in EV, right? The upstream is actually a commodity. There's energy all around us in the grid, right? Uh, but the transaction gets hard. How do I take energy from the grid? How do I dump it into the battery, into the cells, manage each cell? And so fundamentally with EV, the choice of where you charge and the energy partner will completely affect your ownership experience. It will affect yeah, how long does my battery last? How fast do I charge my battery? That, what's my resale value of my vehicle, which also comes down to really battery life in EV, right? So fundamentally, a big part of the ownership experience on EV will be determined by the energy part. Right? And that's and to solve for this from an industry structure point of view, because there's on one end, there are charging station operators setting up charging stations. And on the other end, there are OEMs building vehicles with, with batteries. You have to solve both sides of the problem. It is a hard problem and it needs solving both sides, uh, both technically, and also from an industry structure point of view is to bring both stakeholders together and ensure this energy flow is really smooth. Because once you get the energy to the battery, everything after that, EVs are already better at, right? That doesn't need improving. It's really how do you fix this in-between energy flow, right? And that's, that's so which means we need to fix, build technology on both sides, which means it's not just buying chargers and setting it up, or it's not just building batteries, it's not just innovating on cells, it's building the full stack. And in some sense, also abstracting all of this complexity from the end customer, like you rightly said. Because the end customer today, let, let's take the commercial vehicle case, for example. I mean, the guy's parked somewhere on the road. The guy doesn't have uh, the ability to park and charge overnight, right? So a lot of those segments trying to go electric fundamentally struggle on infrastructure. Today, his model is first thing in the morning, refuel diesel in 5 to 15 minutes, and then go do all your uh, loads. Sometimes there's a second shift. So then you need to top up a little more. So flexibility is key to unlock that market. Right? Uh, and they're used to paying so many rupees per day to do so many kilometers, which is what they understand. Right? And that's a fundamental sort of transition that we are trying to bring uh, to them as well, which is, hey, you're re used to refueling 15 minutes in a public refueling ecosystem. Well, that's what we've got for you. You're used to buying the vehicle. Well, that's the vehicle. And you're used to paying for energy on a pay as you go. So we're also sort of bundling the battery and the charging into an energy as a service model, right? which allows you to pay for all of this on a pay as you go model. Right? So this means you're not stuck with a large vehicle, with expensive vehicle, with a large so, battery. Arun, help me here. I'm a customer and here I am. I got my truck. I got my thing. Today, it just cost me, let's say, 10 rupees a kilometer. That's the way, that's the metric I use. 
what would it be in your system? I mean, just the energy cost. Forget the, you know, the original cost of the vehicle. Just the energy cost. What would it be in your business model? The energy as a service model, we're able to provide on, on this on this immediately on day one, right? We're able to provide a fifteen percent reduction on both the upfront cost of the vehicle uh, and uh, on the monthly energy cost that you're paying, as uh, as as compared to a diesel vehicle. And this is generally true irrespective of category. May it be a three wheeler, a four wheeler, or a larger truck. So as are you saying? Your, your, your process and your system, regardless of it's an ethyl scooter or it's a Tata, you know, uh, electric vehicle or any other make of vehicle, can your system charge them regardless? Is it agnostic to the brand? Is it agnostic to the kind of, you know, interface that it has, the voltage that it has? Uh, as I said, uh, it's a two-sided problem. So it's the batteries and the charger. So our batteries have to be on the way. No, so the question really here is, Arun, if I take the total accessible market right now, so one, I, I agree on your approach, which is you're now becoming a solution provider to OEMs. Rather than trying to develop the battery system and everything yourself, you are going to be that solution provider now. So you say, get your partnership early on, help me, I'll be your partner in designing a, the electric system and the other uh, charging system that's required so as to meet your consumer thing for quick charging, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. sort of your, your business uh, yeah. that you want to get into. We also work with end users. So we have three stakeholders. Anyone who's buying a commercial vehicle today, anyone who's building a commercial vehicle, and anyone who's setting up a charging station and wants to make that a profitable business. So we're able to stitch these three stakeholders together. The end user uh, No, I, I can, I, you're, 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 you know, God willing, you can be a, a monopoly because there's very few people who have that ability right now to keep that holistic kind of uh, designing and uh, utility model in place. So I think you that's your disruption. But the fact is, is that how, as you said, scalability acceptability and reliability. These are things when you, before we go into the customer, it's very important to get that part. We all know electric vehicles are far, far more dangerous and explosive also. And the idea is, is that any of these kind of uh, charging, fast charging also comes with those associated risks to, an, to, a, to a sort of a public area. We have to be very cautious of that. With no standards available, how do you also determine which is the standard that you're going to offer and how do you ensure that that would become the sort of the predominant standard that's being used, which makes, makes your product more accessible, right? Your service more accessible. That's a big challenge. How you man, you have to manage so much of the environment here to support your business model. Yeah, it, it's definitely a hard problem. I think any valuable problem is hard. So, so, the, uh, so we've got to solve it uh, because it's, it's needed to be solved. Right. Um, now, with respect to how do we establish for the multiple parts of your question there, right? Is fast charging inherently more dangerous? It's not, right? It's it's today that's why a lot of slow charging that happens and batteries explode. And actually, the, the reason batteries explode is because of charging, right? It's because chargers and batteries don't understand each other. Exactly. And you overcharge a battery. People generally think it's because of the hot temperature, the batteries heat in and explode. It's not true, actually. Right? Uh what generally happens is the chargers accidentally overcharge the cells and a cell actually implodes from within, right? Uh, if you if you overfill a cell, it's very dangerous, right? So if I may interject, Arun, Arun, uh, actually, what Vinay is trying to understand from you, in terms of reliability, in terms of quality assurance, what are the concrete steps are you taking? What are the standardization you are bringing? Number one, number two, to enhance acceptability or adaptability of your model. How are you doing in terms of price quotient, in terms of, uh, you know, affordability? You said that it's very affordable. So just want to understand that part, I think, if I'm not wrong, Vinay, this is yeah. your See, question. it's not me. It's, it's oh, the uh, users uh, and the, I think, your potential customers and your potential, you know, people that could understand the solution that you could offer them. That's the real pitch that I think you're, we're trying to see from you, Arun. Right. So uh, I, I think I mean, when we pitch the users, we obviously talk about our technology, right? And uh, uh, and I think they spend some time here. You know, we bring them, we show, showcase our technology, and obviously they're far more open to using it after that. Uh, now, how do you how do you bring safety, right? You don't bring safety by following a few standards. You 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 bring in safety by by analyzing every nut and bolt, every decision you make, right from a small component all to all the way to the full system and then the overall vehicle and everything else, right? So how do we bring safety to our system? Is it, is it that doesn't come straight to the mind of the consumer. A layman like me, uh, 
will be always convinced nobody will come and tell them that we are not doing due diligence while rolling out the product okay everybody says that for me like i see in some product isi mark i see somewhere you know bs mark or whatever the mark is there we understand this product has certain quality that talks about the standardization similarly i know your product your idea your you know the way you are trying to merge all three is fantastic but for me as a consumer because if you want to scale up you want to increase the you know acceptance of of your product what is that one clear message you are going to give what is one reliability quotient or multiple reliability quotient that you may offer that's what we are trying to understand a proof here. point a proof point yeah. for that yeah so for example we've already done two thousand cycles of, of of cycling right every cycle of our, our battery uh, we've done 15 minute charging followed by one hour discharge right that's a far more aggressive than cycle than real life because in real life you're taking three to four hours to charge a discharge mm -hmm. a vehicle right so we're doing 15 minute charge followed by one hour discharge and we do this back to back we've done two thousand cycles and after two thousand cycles we've lost less than 11 percent of capacity right uh and which is why I was trying to explain before. Today, even with slow charging, people lose 20% right. of battery capacity in 1,000 to 1,500 cycles. So I was, slow speed of charging and battery life are generally assumed to be linked and things that you can only have one of. You either have to go slow charging with longer life or fast charging with lesser life. That's not true. And I think that's what we're trying to establish, right? If you get way smarter understanding what's happening inside the cell, you're, you can then push it uh, to its limit while still ensuring that it does not get damaged. And when you do that, you can actually have the full cell cycle life and also have the ability to charge it faster. And that's what we've okay. done. So uh, Arun, what stage are you at then? Is this still experimental or have you actually gone to market with this approach? And there are some real vehicles with uh, customers, real customers out there who are sort of proving this out right now. Yeah, so we've got a first uh, OEM on board and uh, we're working with them. Uh, we have our, actually, we have a first few set of on board vehicles that just came out uh, a week ago, uh, which okay. has our batteries. Of course, we're working with OEM that already sells electric vehicles. And they have a different battery and we've sort of been able to provide a variant for them saying hey listen that's your that's a vehicle that you already have now we let's do a rapid charge variant uh, as well right and uh, we'll obviously sort of publicly announce this in a mm. in, in a few weeks and uh, we're happy to talk about how that partnership is going to play forward at that point of time uh, but but right now as i said we've, we've significantly focused on end customers right maybe an oem us or charging station operator at the end of the day the end customer matters so we've been working very heavily with fleet aggregators and logistics partners to, because they're the end customers and they're paying for all of it, whether they're paying for the vehicle or the battery or the charging network. So it's so, important that they're happy. So your first, they, the first category of customers is uh, sort of the, um, you know, the, the B2B kind of things, right? Where you actually yeah. have fleets and you're going to operate with them. Uh, so just tell us then, what is your journey going to be? Here it is. What's the kind of accessible market that you're trying to look at? And then what's going to be the expectation for end users like us, which you'll see. I think what you're doing right now, Arun, is you have the potential to really uh, bring electric vehicles ahead of the game. You can get more OEMs interested and provide them solutions that they're looking for, and they get closer to their customer experience that they're looking to provide for. So the idea is, is that the faster you move, the faster you will sort of start capturing the space and sort of make it more difficult for any competitor to come in. So uh, how are you going to really go about that? Aspects, right? Which is on the, on the battery side, how do you ensure that uh, whatever we're building, the tech we're building is flexible enough and wide enough so that any OEM can build Correct. anything they want. Right? And that's a cross compatibility they've talked about. And having been on the OEM side and having built vehicles, we completely empathize and understand what OEMs need. So we've thought through, hey, you can build, use any cell that you want. You can build this in any voltage platform. You can build any capacity, any number of wheels. And our flexible energy stack, are, uh, we will still charge it up in 15 minutes. So all you have to standardize in some sense is use our PMS and use some of the connectors that we're using. right? That, that then lets you charge up in 15 minutes. right? So that's on one side. How do you create a wide enough funnel? And uh, I would say... A flexible, flexible enough Lego set that anyone can build whatever they want to build. And then the yeah, other end, Arun, I'll just say one. I mean, I, 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 I hear you there. Having been an OEM uh, person myself, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of testing before an OEM will even approve a solution that has. I mean, let's be honest. 
you're you're a new player. You sort of don't have the sort of do you have the credentials you believe that to actually have access to them them, and secondly to listen to you and then actually try your technology out. How are you breaking that barrier? How are you breaking that glass ceiling? I think the glass ceiling itself is sort of vanishing, right? Okay. Because uh, like cell phones, there's a disruption. Right? This is not going to be a two or three OEM play anymore, right? There are hundreds of OEMs in the cell phone market, and that's what's happening in EVs as well, right? Uh, uh, it's fundamental disruption to how you can design, build, and manufacture EVs, right? Uh, and uh, that's changed the game. So honestly, in India, there are already 30 plus OEMs already selling commercial vehicles. Right? And I've not even counted the number of guys selling two wheelers, but I think there's, there's a wide spectrum of quality there. Right. But uh, so I think it's it's while the larger OEMs are definitely looking to move to, towards going electric and test timelines, etc., is definitely part of uh, part of the planning that we do. I think that a lot of OEMs are more happy to adopt a technology and get to market quicker. And then what they're seeing is believing uh, there are engineers on both ends. And I think once you get down to the brass tacks and explain how we're doing what we're doing. Once they, 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 they don't just see rapid charging and walk away. They really, once we partner with someone, they really see under the road every bit of what we're doing, how we're doing. Right. I think that obviously gives a lot more confidence. And at the end of the day, uh, they see the value proposition. If, if their vehicle can go charge in 15 minutes and can access our network, uh, it's a logical decision, um, right? Uh, and uh, as long as we're able to build trust in the net technology, which I always think is the last piece to the puzzle, right? Once there's conviction that this is a valuable problem statement, uh, companies should partner together. There's always ways to build trust around the technology. I think I think uh, that's something we've been able to do, at least with a few OEMs. Uh, maybe in a year, I'll be able to talk talk to you, be able to repeat this across multiple. No, OEMs. I wish you all the best because you really have a proposition to offer. And I think, as I mentioned, it can change their whole timeline for their go-to-market and their product acceptability and the adoption of electric vehicles. And I think, uh, can I ask? Is there a solution comparable anywhere else in the world? Or is this something that you have uh, sort of uh, got a proprietary uh, design or a proprietary technical de uh, development on? Uh, it, I think it's the first time in the world. Uh, hmm. Also because I think the rest of the world doesn't care about rapid charge. Right? Uh, if I'm, because you have to choose between energy density and power density. That's, so what's bad about our batteries is our batteries are a little bulkier and they take up a lot more volume than regular batteries. Right, So that's the negative. So you have to choose between power density and energy density. And if I'm in the US or Europe, I'm selling a Tesla or a high performance sedan. They're four wheelers um, more, less two wheelers, wheelers there. Right. Four wheelers. Uh, the price point is different. I can afford a large battery, 400, 500 kilometers. You have dedicated parking at home. So you're going to charge overnight and park overnight and charge overnight 90% of the time. Right. So that market uses public charging only 10% of the time during highway transit. Very different in India. We can't afford large batteries. We, we need smaller batteries. People who own passenger cars don't park at home in India, right? Uh, I mean, let alone the commercial vehicle space, which 100% not park at home, right? So India needs smaller batteries that can be topped up more quickly on a rapid, on, on a public charging network, right? So sort of get in, get out, talk, do this whenever you feel like, recharge like you refuel and keep going. So while this whole concept of large batteries and charge at home works for the top 10% of India, I think you can't cut copy paste that strategy for all of India, which is why we had to rethink what, how energy will be simplified for India. And which way, in some I sense, I'll just interject. We are running out of time. We are okay, all we're done. I will, no, no, this is no, it's becoming really interesting. <laughs> I have some questions for you also. And uh, as far as I understand, what, Arun, you are try, uh, trying to say that uh, it's a kind of one charger fits all. That's the kind of rapid charger you have, right? Thousand percent, yeah. One charger fits, right? fits all for sure. Yeah, like two-wheeler or car or anything, any size, doesn't matter, okay? Yeah. We did just want to understand is how much you have been part of the OEM, you know how the vehicles are configured, what are the technical, how much acceptability do you think it will have? Because so, swapping, uh, about, there was huge challenges. Swapping mm -hmm. means uh, there was a structural ch a challenge, the kind of vehicle they're going to have, two-wheeler, three-wheeler, they thought that swapping can work. But one charger fits all, all kind of battery capacity, all kind of structure. Do you think it would work? I mean, uh, see, in theory, it sounds like it can work and it should be possible, but it means a lot of collaboration with so many sort of partners and ecosystem development over here. I think uh, the electric vehicle sort of whole ecosystem 
the disruption can happen at any point nabil and i mm. think the one that really has to be established is the power source the point is, is that that is the most expensive and that is the most part of the customer that is its biggest fear people aren't worried about the electric motor for example they're not worried about the overall form factor they love the idea that these form factors can change what they really scared about is is that fear of you know mileage okay and that whole thing of uh, where do i get this charge and how do i know i can go anywhere if that experience can be done then i think you have found you know the universal key to getting electric vehicles adopted a lot faster this is sort of the last frontier right now in consumer experience that nobody is convinced about if if you can showcase to the oems that this technology does it if they're convinced about its reliability its scalability and more importantly its standardization that it can offer it there because at the end they're going to put their brands behind it they're going to put the safety of their customers on it so that's where the challenge is can it be a my my only expectation is is that will a small player do it or will it be somebody in the big area which is going to go ahead and convince because the investment required just to get that awareness out there is going to exceed uh, you know the cost of development so that i think is going to be a challenge on proving that out so if you can do that arun you have a win and why go india i mean i think you should look at a global aspect first given that uh, you have a better acceptability of a thing there for some of these larger vehicles rather than just a two wheeler kind of a battery if you can prove it there getting it into a two wheeler scaling it down would be far far easier that would be my view yeah so we are we're not on focusing on two wheelers right now but but i i, I hear you um and i think while there are companies that will want to build their own tech and take the vertically integrated approach that's the top 10 percent i think rest of india needs an enabler and we believe will it be us but i think i think we believe so and uh, uh arun it's been about two years you have been into the business you started this business just want to understand how uh, i know that it's too early to ask these questions but still uh, you must have done your maths and just want to understand what kind of business potential do you see there and what is the current order book you have right now and where what, what kind of uh, market or business revenue you see in the next few years right so our first market is the commercial vehicle space right as i said last my lot six three wheeler four wheeler form factors we're not even looking at two wheelers why are we looking at these the commercial vehicles because of the energy consumption Con commercial vehicles are only 10% of the vehicles in india but consume 70% of our energy right no that we, i just want to understand how much of business you expect now so you ask me about the size of market right so whatever you pay for diesel you'll pay for batteries and charging in the future and that's the business that we are in right uh, of course we'll find a way to share this uh, with with multiple stakeholders the oems the charging station operators a little bit for ourselves uh, but i think we're in the business of energy and it's quite a valuable market right uh, uh, even if 30% of india goes electric what's the number what kind of market do you expect like uh, this is uh, a billion dollar or 500 million dollar what kind of market do you assess in yeah, the next 30% of electric 30% of commercial vehicles in india go electric that's a 50 50 billion dollar market right in just batteries and, and charging right and so how do you see yourself so we say ourselves sort of uh, obviously well fighting for that market right and uh, starting with last mile uh, and then proceeding to larger form factors made be mid mile trucks Uh, with these are seven to twelve ton trucks, and of course larger trucks along the highway. But we right what now we order order have right now. Do you have any order book uh, from the OEMs? You said that you have. So just want to understand what kind of business order you already have backed. So uh, so today our demand comes directly from end customers, right? So so while we work with OEMs as partners, our customers are still guys running logistics. So our order book comes from anyone running logistics, and we have a, we have the first few thousand vehicles that we are working towards. uh executing and pushing out right so uh that's that's the order book that we're focusing on right now uh, in just in just bangalore right uh and the first one so what can you, yeah 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 if i can go understand what so what what give me some customer feedback of these tests that you've done right now have they been pleasantly surprised have they been you know oh i i never knew this tell us some of the actual reactions you had see for for end customers right uh the guys running logistics they're the business of running logistics hmm. today if they want to go electric they they're forced to become ev experts that's their biggest concern right uh, and on top of that 
they for every electric vehicle that they pilot they have to find dedicated parking set up a dedicated charger uh, sort of pay for all of this at the end of the day you're also paying crazy amis month on month because ev financing by itself is very expensive because the unpredictable battery life right and on top of this these vehicles only do a single shift and it's really hard to plan operations so today it's it's a headache to plan operations you're losing money this pressure of someone's putting like an amazon's putting pressure on you to go electric so everyone's like oh man i've got a pilot electric vehicle so in some sense they need a simplified solution right so what we are able to stitch together and the peace of mind we are able to give is hey listen here's a vehicle partner that you already like we work with them here's a battery that we're giving a five year warranty for 3000 cycle warranty here's a financing solutions so we are also able to provide longer financing with our battery right so we are able to provide a four year financing and you don't need to set up a charger in your warehouse you don't need to plan charging it's just it's all all are taken care of so obviously they're very excited and uh, they're sort of relieved uh by that we are able to solve all of this uh but it we are just getting started so uh yeah. i mean i think so can uh, i ask the first round of fi financing that you've got what what is that going to uh, be deployed for are you going to do more technology are you going to now get into production are you getting into market what is well, it uh, that you're focused that you, on you're not going to investments right yes your yeah. your current investment that you got well, how are you going to deploy that so so a lot of that is towards uh, technology development taking our technology that we already have to pro product productization phase which is scale scales up bring in not just design reliability which is what we we test for but also process reliability uh, as we scale up manufacturing right so obviously we need a much larger team uh, for that uh, the next phase is also the next set of investments is always also towards a deployment team for both our charging mm -hmm. stations uh, mm -hmm. and a business development team that holds together a lot of our partnerships maybe end logistics aggregators or also our our, our OEM partners so so that's so, so the that question where do you see yourself 5 years from now what would what what would i imagine you at i think five years from now we want to be the energy partner of choice i think we want you to say hey listen i love this a little bit more a little bit more down to earth i mean uh, how many more oems have you got how many users do you think are adopting your technology how many markets or how much of the sort of charging share do you have of uh, the country I mean, I I think again, okay, market share numbers are are fairly early to talk about, right? Because the 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 market itself is so it's it's not it's not an incremental market; it's a disruptive market. So would you have a competitor? Years, would you be the main partner? Where would sorry? you be? Would you be the main choice of partner? You know, that is for 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 that solution. Or do you think there'll be others who can come over and adopt your technology? Is this technology yeah. so proprietary, or is it something that can be easily sort of again? You can see it in various forms. and that's a thing technology is fairly hard to build uh, as a team uh, we've been building evs for many years now in india mm -hmm. and building bad, bad, building evs in india is hard the techno the temperatures the grids the roads they don't make it easy you can't just clearly a lot of oems have tried buying technology from europe or china and just try to launch it here right it doesn't work i mean mm -hmm. people realize you got to do this in india and uh, you sort of have raised, uh, arun you have raised about 6 million dollar if i'm not wrong right now right at what valuation you have raised this and what's your next target for funds uh, i mean some some of the data is is publicly available so people can look at it if they need to uh, but uh, but but uh, i said we, we are well capitalized for the next 18 months we we raised a million early on to focus on technology development more recently we raised uh, some more funding to focus on as i said productization and deployment we now just focusing on opening up bangalore that's that's our immediate focus uh, i think the market is large enough so uh, investors are watching you right now can you can you share with us at what valuation you are raising fund right now for your company what is the valuation current valuation yeah, fund right now as i said uh, we okay. will capitalize for like 18 months so uh, we we will be focusing on opening up bangalore Uh, and then Delhi, and then we look at scaling it up. And at some point in time, we look at raising a larger number. So. Okay. So, what percentage of this fund goes into R and D or technical development? What percentage goes into um, deployment? You said a lot goes into deployment. Just want to understand if you could share with me. Uh, Flash. Yes, it goes towards uh, technology and productization, which is getting our batteries, our tech, uh, into production. Uh, right, uh, deployment is actually a fairly small chunk. Uh, it's it's less than twenty percent of our money goes towards deployment. Most of our money goes towards R and D, people, prototypes, testing, manufacturing. Most means how much? What percentage? Most means what percent? Seventy percent, eighty percent, sixty percent? Yeah, uh, up to the seventy percent. Okay. People, people, and people, and people, and the whole R and D operational expense. That that's seventy percent. 
Yeah. And and that's where your value is eventually going to come through, right? And more and yeah. more of that getting proven out. I mean, deployment, there, there are enough partners that whose job is to deploy and run logic. So we're really just a technology enablers here. And we want no, to- I think I think you're going to be the solution provider for everyone. Uh, yeah. And I think that's the way you should pitch yourself that you don't uh, don't go into trying this journey yourself. We've already done that and we have solutions that could be universal and could be also tailored or you know proprietary to your requirements. So no need for you to reinvent the wheel over there. That would be my approach on how you could go about it, Arun. Arun, Arun what, what's your turnover target for next five years? What would be your revenue in next five years? Just want to understand that. I, 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 uh, I, I don't think this is how we sort of plan because, because we're still building, we're still an early tech company. And uh, mm -hmm. I think when you're churning out the same vehicle every year, you can do 10% projections and get to a fire target. But uh, but that's not the space that we're in. That's not the sort of company that we are. So, so the market is large enough. I think the market we're going after is a $50 billion market. Uh, uh, and now, it doesn't matter. We, we, we target to get 80% of that. We get 30% of that. We're still a large enough company. So I think right now, uh, the objective is, uh, and both, I think how investors look at it, how we look at it is, hey, let's get to the short term traction. Let's build out strong partnerships and let's build out last mile first, right? And in the top 20 cities. And that itself will get us to a place where we're doing 100 million worth of revenue, right? If if you're really looking for a number on, on how much money. That's good. Good. Job. Vinay, I would like to have your final comment on uh, exponent energy on these three aspects. No. In terms of uh, one being the lowest, ten being the um, you know highest mark. Where will you place exponent energy when it comes to scalability, uh, business viability, and adaptability at the global level and Indian level? What would okay. be your mark? So uh, I think uh, I would, uh, off the cuff, I would say a, a very strong seven and a half. Definitely, your three quarters of the journey there. Why? Because you do have you identified the problem statement very accurately. You're looking at exactly solving that with a very clear focus that that's the only thing I need to solve. You will do it through technology. That technology can be, be, it can be a black box, but it will deliver on the ground. And you have customers that are very diverse. You can have the end user, direct users, any type of vehicle, as you rightly said. So that gives you a sort of a broad accessible market to work on. Electric vehicles is clearly the growth area and you're early enough on to be able to become the first choice of partner in that area. So I think you have a very strong, you're very well capitalized, obviously. So that gives you the, uh, you know, the agility as well as you have the buffer to go through some of the developments that you're required. So please get your development, focus on that, prove it out, get that reliability. And I think you can definitely emerge a leader. And clearly you have the technology story pretty much uh, worked out and you've got, uh, you're industrializing that. So you're ahead of the game. So keep that gap between you and your next part, you know, uh, competitor wider and wider, and you can stay ahead of the game. So amazing, kudos. And uh, it would have been lovely to have also had this discussion with your partner, Sanjay, but uh, I know both of you put together must be a formidable force. So good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll pass on the regards. I'm sure he's watching. They both no, no. were part of F Energy and both took this uh, plunge together. And I'm sure they have a long way to go. Thank you so much, Arun, for joining it, your startup. Thank you so much, Vinay, for taking out time. And a pleasure. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you, Thanks, All the very best, Arun, and look forward to staying in touch. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was a fantastic uh, discussion on Startup Adda. Stay tuned to ET Auto for more information, news, and analysis on automotive and mobility industry. And don't forget to tune in at 3 p.m. next Tuesday as we bring to you another startup and expert to discuss new mobility ideas. Till then, take care. Goodbye.